Dooku stands inside that room on the invisible hand alongside Palpatine, gazing into the oblivion beyond. Master, it seems that our plan will soon be executed. The Republic will fall, and the Sith will rise to reign over the galaxy. Dooku says, smiling. Yes, Lord Tyrannus, soon we shall rule this failing Republic. Palpatine responds. However, at that moment, Dooku can sense something odd about his master. There's a dark aura about him, and Dooku can feel that there is something different about what Palpatine is intending than normal. Is everything alright, Master? Dooku asks. Palpatine looks back at his apprentice. Everything is exceptional, Lord Tyrannus. He replies, smiling heavily. In that instant, Dooku has an instinct that kicks in. He senses Palpatine's plans. He sees that the Dark Lord is planning on betraying him for somebody better. His stomach drops, and Dooku knows that Sidious is planning to kill him. This man never had the desire to rule the galaxy together. Dooku had been used as a pawn. You devious snake! Dooku exclaims. Before Palpatine can react at all because he's pinned to the chair, Dooku's rage overflows and he slices Palpatine's head clean off. The Chancellor's dark smile remains on his lip as, as his head falls to the floor, thudding as it hits the ground. Dooku takes a moment to look at Palpatine's body before turning towards the elevator, his cape billowing behind him. He didn't need anyone else to help him achieve his goals. Soon, the Separatists would secede from the Republic, and then he would emerge victorious. Dooku knew that he never should have trusted Republic scum like Palpatine. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if Dooku had killed Palpatine on the Invisible Hand? Well folks, if you have, then you are in for a treat today because that's exactly what we'll be exploring in this video. So grab your big bowl of Bantha stew and let's dive right in together to what if Dooku had killed Palpatine. After Dooku kills Palpatine, he knows that he has to get off the Invisible Hand quickly. So he goes to the bridge and he informs Grievous that he's leaving. I'm leaving for Rexus Prime, he says to Grievous very abruptly. We have killed the Chancellor, and now I must solidify our stance with the government. We, Grievous, are now even more grave traitors than we were before, he continues. Grievous nods, accepting Dooku's explanation. Then he turns and begins commanding his droid forces to continue bombarding the Republic forces in the air. Dooku leaves in one of his Separatist shuttles, determined to get to Raxus Prime and inform his government of their massive victory here before the Republic today. While they didn't have any more leverage against the Republic, they had clearly shown their might, and Dooku would express that to the rest of the galaxy. When Obi-Wan and Anakin arrive in that room on the invisible hand where Dooku had been with the Chancellor, they are stunned. Oh my. Obi-Wan says, looking at the Chancellor's decapitated body and the head on the floor. I certainly don't think this was in our plans now, was it, Master? Anakin says, shaking his head and feeling a sense of grief inside him at the death of his close confidant and friend. We have to get out of here. If they killed the Chancellor, they won't spare any troops trying to kill us as well, Obi-Wan says. And Grievous is a notorious commander. We have to leave now, Anakin, Obi-Wan says. Anakin nods, agreeing with his master. In this situation, they aren't bogged down by the Chancellor, so they continue to run down the hallways, completely unencumbered by unconsciousness or the slowness of the Chancellor. When they reach the hangar bay, they immediately find R2-D2, jump in their Jedi Starfighters, and hop out of the Invisible Hand, ready to go down to Coruscant and inform the Senate of what had happened and what they had witnessed aboard the Invisible Hand. Anakin feels anger and rage bubbling up inside of him, but he learns to calm it, at least for the moment, because now he had a duty to the Republic and to the Jedi, and he would get the job done. One thing was for certain, however. Dooku was a traitor, and now, for his actions of criminal intent against the Republic, he needed to be brought to justice, and Anakin believes that this should be done with the harshest penalty possible. Death by execution. While Dooku goes to Rexus Prime, he sits in meditation. Now, he had killed the master, and he had become the one Sith in charge. He was the one who held the keys to the galaxy in his hands, and now he could use his government to gain more power unencumbered by the ways of the Sith and his master. Dooku was in charge now, and he had the power to do whatever he wanted. 
He would use the Separatists now to gain more power to consolidate his influence across the galaxy and become the most famous figure alive. In addition, he would also separate from the Republic and he would have his own government that would not be encumbered by the entirely incompetent bureaucracy that had embroiled the galactic government. Soon, Dooku would be free from his chains. When Dooku arrives on Raxus, he's greeted by the praise and the adoration of citizens from across the Confederacy who believe in his message of freedom for the Separatists. Many of the corporate leaders also greet him, shaking his hand, and Dooku nods in turn, giving them a look of appreciation. He appears humble, yet majestic, with his cape fluttering behind him in the slight Raxus breeze and his mouth turned downwards. He appeared solemn, but also ready to completely dedicate himself to the Separatist cause. As he walks in, without guards, to the Separatist Parliament, he looks at his entire population that's been waiting for him, and he smiles. This was what he had worked so hard for. While he was a Sith, he also still cared about the people underneath him. He cared about the people of the Outer Rim, and he believes that the Jedi had become corrupt. So, he continues into the Parliament building, and he is ready to give his speech and take the control that he had deserved for all those years. No longer was Palpatine a threat to him. Now, he would be the one in charge. As the Separatists rise in the Parliament for his entrance, Dooku takes his place at the height of the Separatist Parliament, and he rises, ready to give his rousing speech. He looks around at the Senators present, and the Parliamentarians, and the lawmakers who had legislated many of the incremental reforms that had brought the Confederacy to fruition throughout this war. Dooku gestures that they may be seated, and they sit down all of their eyes on him, ready to hear what this reformer had to say. When Dooku begins to speak, he commands the entire room, and they are impressed by his humble yet impressively imposing nature. Dooku begins by saying what had happened on the Invisible Hand. Yes, I killed the Chancellor of the Republic. Dooku starts. This elicits gasps from all of the Separatists present, but also a round of applause. I killed him with my own hands, and I believe that this is the best course of action forward. While we do not have the same leverage that we did against the Republic, now we have shown our power and our willingness to do whatever it takes to separate. After years of Republic oppression, we have finally shown them that we have the power to fight back against their reign of tyranny over the Outer Rim. Dooku continues. The parliamentarians clap for him, excited by his message of hope for those in the Outer Rim and his incredible act against the Republic, showing his true devotion to the cause. Without the Chancellor, the Republic will be in chaos. Now, my friends, is our time to strike. While they are weak and while they are unprepared for attacks and have greater priorities than their military might. Now is our time to take a stand. Now, Separatists, is our time to make a difference and turn the tides of this great war in our favor, Dooku says. Once again, the crowd cheers for Dooku as he gesticulates violently, imposing his points on the audience. Friends, now is our time to take the top position in this conflict. I do not wish to see the Republic suffer. I only wish to see the Separatists succeed. And now is our opportunity to make them listen to our demands even further. I believe that General Grievous, a hero of our war effort, and command our forces to victory, and I will be there right beside him every step of the way, Dooku says. The crowd goes wild. Dooku raises his hands, proclaiming the glory of the Separatist cause, and everybody is on board. Grievous, who had been sitting beside him, stands up, laughing, cackling, 
ready to give some revenge to the Republic that had stripped him of so much. He was going to show the Jedi that he was the commander that he had always wanted to be, and soon he would make the Republic pay for what they had done on his homeworld. Dooku smiles. This is exactly the vision that he had had for the galaxy, and now he was in charge of his own destiny. Meanwhile, in an emergency vote in the Senate chambers, after Anakin and Obi-Wan tell everyone what had happened aboard the Invisible Hand and the incredibly disgusting discovery that they had made, Masamita proclaims an emergency election. In this moment, there are a few people who rise to the occasion. Nobody wants to be a wartime chancellor, as it is an incredibly stressful position. However, one rises up above the rest and puts her name forward to become Chancellor of the Republic, and that is the famous Mon Mothma. She wants to make peace with the Separatists, and she wants to do whatever it takes to end this bloodbath, this conflict that had torn the Republic apart and changed the very face of what they believed in. Mon Mothma proposes a deal to the Separatists that would allow for peace and their mutual reintegration into the Republic, accepting all of their demands. However, Dooku is not satisfied with this. Instead, the Sith Lord wants full sovereignty for the Separatists, and he wants to use the full might of the droid army to achieve this. He will accept nothing less from the Republic than total surrender and complete acknowledgement of their right to exist as an independent state. Because of this, war continues to rage on across the galaxy. Because Dooku was no longer hiding behind Palpatine's veneer of creating a war, and now he actually had the power to completely challenge the Republic, he uses that full might of the droid army to attack again one of the Republic's strongholds and steadfast places for their war effort, Kamino. He launches a full-fledged attack out of absolutely nowhere. The Republic doesn't expect it at all. He sends Grievous to go there with a massive fleet of Separatist ships, and he goes all out with the droid armies that attack. Knowing that there are ARC troopers there and learning from last time, Grievous sends down an incredible squad of droid commandos to try and take on these clones head first. Shakti does her best to defend the facility against attack, actually caring for the clone soldiers in their training, believing in their well-being, but Grievous has other plans. In a duel with Shakti, much like in that deleted scene from Revenge of the Sith where he stabs her and she dies, Grievous follows his destiny and slices down the Togruta Jedi. He cackles as he slays clone after clone after clone, and even goes as far as to take the Prime Minister and Nalase hostage. In this attack, the Separatists simply overwhelm the clones. They simply overwhelm the Republic because they have so many more numbers, and now, because Palpatine isn't controlling the war, Dooku feels that he can use the full might of the droid army to absolutely annihilate Kamino. Hell rains down from the sky, and it looks as though the Separatists have won a critical victory in taking the cloning facility on Kamino. After this attack on Kamino, the sustainment of the Republic military is completely destroyed. This leads Mon Mothma to gain some support for her idea that they should simply cave into the demands of the Separatists and allow them to secede peacefully so that they could gain back control of their military asset while simultaneously ensuring peace for the rest of the galaxy. The galaxy needs peace. That's the promise that I was elected on, and I will try to ensure that the galaxy receives that peace that we all so desperately crave. An end to this war is near, my friends, and I am afraid that we very well may not win it. However, we can ensure security for the rest of the galaxy, and that our citizens may live in harmony once again without fear of separatist attack, Mon Mothma pleads to the Senate. Padme endorses her, saying that this is the best way forward and that she believes a peace agreement with the Separatists could truly create a new era of prosperity for the galaxy, one that doesn't rely on the military-industrial complex that had been created by Palpatine and where the ideals of the High Republic, exploration, freedom, peace, and mutual cooperation are once again brought to the forefront of what it means to be the galactic government. Obi-Wan also supports this plea as the negotiator. 
He's seen far too much going on, and while he is loyal to the Republic and believes that Dooku is a traitor to everything that he holds dear, he still thinks that perhaps this dragged on war where they were outnumbered, outgunned, and outsupported by the corporations was futile to continue. Beyond that, the League of Neutral Systems also agrees that they think this war is completely frivolous and that the two sides should reconcile. They're even willing to support a signing of a peace treaty on a neutral world to illustrate their dedication to continued cooperation throughout the entire galaxy and pacifism. While Mandalore is embroiled in the Siege of Mandalore and the conflict that was ensuing between the clones, Ahsoka, Maul, and bo there were still many other systems that at this time are calling for an end to the war. Anakin, however, cannot get over what Dooku did to his confidant and his father figure. He's still mad. How can you possibly endorse a peace treaty with that man? Anakin says bitterly with Padme and Obi-Wan in the room. How can you possibly endorse a peace treaty with the one who committed treason and killed our Chancellor? Not only that, but he committed treason against our order too. The Jedi, Anakin says. His emotions are dark and rage clouds his vision. Obi-Wan looks at him. Anakin, I don't agree with anything that Dooku has done, and I believe that he is a traitor as well. However, I'm thinking of the greater good of the galaxy. The Separatists have basically won this war. We can no longer produce clones. Kamino is theirs. Consider this, Anakin. What would happen if we didn't give in to their demands? More people would die. More of the galaxy would be embroiled in chaos, and we would just be fighting a war that we were destined to lose, Obi-Wan says. As the great negotiator, I believe that this is the time to finally have the peace that we've sought, to be the real Jedi in the galaxy, not warriors, but peacekeepers. Anakin looks at Padme. Are you seriously going to endorse a peace treaty with Dooku? He asks. Padme looks back at him, her eyes stern. Anakin, you know that I love you, but my commitment is to the Republic, to democracy. I want to see peace. I've always wanted to see peace. I wanted to see peace with Mina Bonteri. But then, talks fell through. No, this is our chance to finally end the war, Anakin, she says. I believe in us, don't you? I think you need to get past your hatred for Dooku. Let it go. Obi-Wan looks at Anakin as well. You're not sounding much like a Jedi right now, Anakin. Again, please, let your prejudice go. See the greater good of the galaxy. Anakin shakes his head and leaves the conversation. He's not the only one who thinks this way, though. There are many Palpatine loyalists in the Senate who continue to want to seek this prolonged war. Anakin is just a fraction of the individuals who still want to see Dooku brought to justice for his crimes against the Republic, and who want the Separatists completely eradicated, no matter how long it took or how they had to do it. When Mon Mothma sees this chaos in the Senate, she knows that nothing is going to get passed. So, she ends up having a secret meeting and convening of the Security Council. There, she puts forward a proposal that she believes would be the best way to satisfy both sides. She decides that in order to ensure minimum bloodshed for the future, but also to satisfy the Palpatine fanatics that were so mad at Dooku for his actions, that she believed a peace treaty could be signed with the Separatists, while also simultaneously sending a squad of clone commandos led by Jedi to deal with Dooku in the shadows. My friends, you know that I'm a pacifist. You know that I don't like this idea. But we need compromise sometimes, and this is what I believe is the best compromise. We are never going to get that agreement with the Separatists signed if Dooku isn't dead. So, I believe that this secret mission will be the best way forward, she says. Colonel Yularen looks at her as well. I agree, Chancellor. I believe that this will be a spectacular mission, and that we will ensure the exact results that we want. Our military is precise, and our commandos are even more so. I will contact General Skywalker and General Kenobi immediately, as I know that they will be on board with this plan as well, because they are spectacular military commanders. Mon Mothma looks at him. Good. Yes, I know that as well. I have full faith in Yularen, and I have full faith in them as well, she says. Now let us go, and let us sign this treaty with the Separatists, granting them what they want. But... Remember, 
This is not the end of the conflict, she says. That will only be reached when Dooku is finally gone. Over the next few days, Mon Mothma uses her executive authority as a wartime chancellor to decide that she was going to sign this peace treaty with the Separatists. While the Palpatine loyalists are absolutely infuriated, Mon Mothma knows that they will be satisfied once Dooku is dead. In a live, televised broadcast to the galaxy, she announces her intentions to sit down with the Speaker of the Separatist Parliament and sign an agreement that would end all hostilities and grant the Confederacy full sovereignty from Republic oversight. This is met with mixed results. Many people are absolutely fanatically in favor of this. They've seen their planets torn apart by Separatist and Republic conflict, and now they finally will have that peace that they desired. Others, who are spectacularly Republic fanatics believe that this is the wrong course of action and that the Separatists are being rewarded for poor actions. However, the Republic still goes forward with this. A few days later, on Raxus, Mon Mothma and the Speaker of the Separatist Parliament end up signing that deal, inking it into paper and ensuring the return of Kamino to the Republic. Dooku is also in attendance, but as more of a figurehead than an actual political leader. He doesn't have any technical political authority within the system, however, he is the voice of the Confederacy. Dooku is the individual who embodies the entire movement, so him being there shows that he truly cares and that the Confederacy is alive and well. He gets to sign an honorary signature onto the paper, and he looks at Mon Mothma with his signature look of superiority, smiling slightly. He also sees Kenobi there as well, and he wonders where Skywalker is. Because every time that Kenobi had shown up, Skywalker wasn't far behind. Was the Republic plotting something? Was there something else going in the shadows that Dooku didn't know about? Or maybe, just maybe, Skywalker couldn't face him after what he had done to the Chancellor which was fair. Dooku could also have that intuition to sense that Skywalker must not have been in approval of this course of action. Dooku knows that Anakin is always very headstrong, and so thinking about this makes him happy. The division within the Jedi Order and the Republic that he had created allows for his government to become stronger, which Dooku is very much in favor of. Maybe. Perhaps maybe the people who were disenfranchised by the Republic would one day join him, or they would choose to secede themselves and start their own government separate from Mon Mothma's new bureaucratic mess that she was going to inherit. Mon Mothma, the Speaker, and Dooku all shake hands, and Obi-Wan stands there with an absolute stone-cold look on his face. Dooku nods at the old apprentice, wishing that he had met him when he was in the Order. Dooku believes that Obi-Wan would have been a good person to meet, and, as the apprentice of Qui-Gon Jinn, that they would have had a lot in common, and a significant amount to discuss before the Clone Wars started. It was a shame that Obi-Wan was so clouded by the vision of the Jedi. Dooku ends up going back to Sreno and throwing a massive victory party for all of the prominent Separatists and corporate leaders who had helped him and enabled his success for the signing of the treaty. Together, they end up enjoying a significant amount of Bantha brew alongside some delicious catered Bantha stew. Dooku also sips a significant amount of Spotchka, basking in its glory. Count Dooku, we are very happy with this transition of power, Newt Gunray says to him at the party. The Trade Federation thanks you for all of your service and how you have helped us usurp the Republic governance, he says. For too long, the Republic has been far too... Dooku ends up cutting off Newt Gunray. Yes, yes, Newt. I am very pleased as well. Thank you for coming along for the ride. Now if you'll excuse me, I must do more. Dooku shakes his head, wondering why the cowardly Nymoidian wanted to talk to him again. He'd gotten what he'd wanted. Now it was time for him to just do whatever he wanted with the Trade Federation. After a few too many Bantha brews and spotchkas, Dooku starts to grow tired, and while he allows his guests to continue socializing in his ballroom on Sereno, the Count announces that he will be retiring for the evening. Thank you all for coming. However, I must leave for the night. I believe it is time for me to get my beauty rest after such a spectacular victory for the Confederacy, he says. Everybody cheers for him as he walks away, a big smile on his face. 
Little does he know that when he arrives in his bedchambers, there is a surprise that will be waiting for him. Anakin had managed to sneak in alongside Delta Squad, one of the top clone commando units, and they were ready in the shadows of Dooku's room. When he arrives, Dooku senses that something's off, but because of the alcohol that he had consumed that night, he also is a little bit shady on the details. As he walks in, suddenly, Anakin Skywalker drops from the ceiling and ignites his lightsaber, a fiery rage in his eyes. Master Dooku, he says. Dooku looks at Anakin. Ah, oh, Skywalker, what are you doing here? You're no separatist. Anakin looks at him. No. But I'm here to avenge the man that was my father. Dooku looks back at him. <laughs> Are you talking about Palpatine? The man who wanted to control the galaxy? The man who misled you and manipulated you for years? Your father? Anakin looks back at him. No, you lie. You're a Sith Lord. Palpatine would never. Dooku looks back at him. <laughs> You truly are misguided. I almost feel bad for you, young Skywalker, he says. Dooku's tongue is a little bit loose because of the amount of Bantha brew that he's drank, but at the same time, he also doesn't really care if the galaxy knows that Palpatine was a Sith Lord, because Palpatine is now dead. Dooku'd gotten what he wanted, and that was that. Anakin looks at Dooku. You still caused the deaths of so many across the galaxy by starting this stupid war, this frivolous war, and now... I am here to fight for my Republic. Anakin and Dooku then begin to engage in a massive lightsaber battle as Anakin puts his skills to the test once again against the Master Duelist. Anakin has the advantage of youth and sobriety as Dooku is slightly caught off guard. He wobbles a little bit as he manages to block Anakin's attacks, but whenever he lunges in for one of his own, he's always slightly off the mark. Anakin continues to hammer Dooku with attack after attack, and his blade is a whir of just pure light. The two Force users dance in an eloquent yet powerful dance that Anakin had never engaged in before. He taps into some of his darker emotions, his rage towards Dooku, and his adoration and affection for Palpatine to truly try to catch the Force user off guard. Dooku smiles at this. Maybe, just maybe, Palpatine had still succeeded from beyond the grave in manipulating this young Skywalker and choosing him to be the bearer of the dark side torch. Dooku also manages to, even though he has had a few too many drinks, deflect bolts from all of the Delta crew that are firing at him. He doesn't know where they're coming from, but he can sense in his peripheral vision that someone is there, and whenever somebody tries to shoot him, he blocks it with his saber before quickly going in and attacking Anakin once more. At one point, he spins into the corner and finds Scorch, who is standing there ready to fire. Dooku slices his weapon and then slices through Scorch's armor, killing the clone commando. This only enrages Anakin even further, and he attacks Dooku relentlessly. Dooku, however, is still incredibly smart, and the drinks are starting to wear off as adrenaline continues to kick through his system, and his connection to the Force strengthens. He sees Anakin's anger, and he predicts every one of his movements, blocking each and every one, and seeing the young knight's weaknesses. Eventually, Dooku smiles as he sees Anakin leaving himself open to an attack, and he slices the other arm of the Padawan that he had once known off just like on Geonosis. He then force pushes Anakin towards the wall, smiling, excited that he had defeated Anakin Skywalker yet again. But in that moment, he lets his guard down and he forgets that there are other clones in the room. This is the moment that Boss avenges his fallen comrade and fires Dooku right in the back of the head, instantly killing the Separatist leader. Dooku crumbles to the ground, his eyes wide, but in that moment, as he passes on, He's still happy and satisfied that he had seceded the Confederacy and that his government had been established. His goal had truly been accomplished. Delta Squad gets away putting Commander Skywalker on their back and carrying Scorch's body to give him a proper Mandalorian burial on Coruscant. Weyland Vow, while he didn't seem to care about his troops, would want to see his man buried with honor.
At the end of the day, the Republic manages to keep this attack under wraps. Mon Mothma proclaims to the galaxy that Dooku's death was resulting from fanatical Palpatine loyalists who'd infiltrated his palace and used Republic military technology and secrets to go against the grain and kill Dooku. Now they were out and about, truly on their own, and they would be brought to justice if they were ever found. The Separatists are angry, but they believe Mon Mothma's explanation. With Dooku dead, Palpatine eliminated, and the peace treaty signed, the galaxy begins to rest. Anakin gets a new prosthetic limb, and he also knows that he had gone in and attacked Dooku in rage, rather than calming himself before the Force. He sees that this is a problem, and he knows that he has to work on it in the future. Anakin never leaves the Jedi Order, and he decides to stay with them and continue to raise his children as Jedi on his own. However, despite this peace treaty being signed, and despite Anakin finding inner peace within himself, General Grievous is still angry at the Jedi, and cannot stand that this treaty had been signed. He leaves the Confederacy military and starts his own private militia that is dedicated to hunting down Jedi and avenging his people. He becomes a top priority for the Order to neutralize, especially as the Republic continues to demilitarize following the signed agreement with the Confederacy. While there is peace in the galaxy, chaos is still abundant, and the Republic's work towards rebuilding after the dreadful war that had just torn their government apart continues. Scorch receives a proper Mandalorian burial on Coruscant with the rest of his squad and many other commandos and arcs that he had served with in the past. Waylon Val and Cal Skirata are both present for it, and they are both there to honor a man that they respected. One of the successful things about Mon Mothma's tenure as the Galactic Chancellor is the fact that she introduces a Galactic Rebuild program, which is dedicated to rebuilding infrastructure that has been torn apart by the war. This is used by funneling some of the old military budget into new social projects to help build the galaxy back into a state of peace. She also begins to establish new diplomatic relations with the Confederacy of Independent Systems, believing that their peace would be the path towards a better future for both of them. Even though the Jedi decide to help, they are not directly involved with the program, as Mon Mothma wanted to try and distance the Jedi from the government following the war. Some even go and aid the Separatists who need help rebuilding, but they are often frowned upon by a lot of the Republic loyalists. The dogmatic Republican Jedi are very upset with this, but these Jedi that go and help people don't care, especially people like Ahsoka, Anakin, and Obi-Wan who really just want to help the people of the galaxy rather than only exclusively fighting for the Republic. Citizens on both sides now have something to put their faith in after a long, devastating war, and it appears that despite Grievous's antics, the galaxy was transitioning into a period of stability for everyone. Hey there folks, now is the time in the video where we transition into the Ask Anything segment, where we take questions from the Discord and discuss them at the end of our videos so you can get to know us a little better. Today's question comes from Viper78, and he asks if we do crossovers. Well, that's something that's still in the works. As a relatively small channel, we haven't really had too many opportunities for that yet. However, it is a possibility in the future as we continue to grow and our brand continues to get stronger. We'll see. It depends where God takes us, and I don't know if we'll do any crossovers. But right now, we're sticking to our solo videos, and perhaps we might have one or two in the works. But we will see, and we'll keep you updated on that if it happens. Thanks for watching today's video. I hope that each and every one of you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave down in the comments below what you think might happen in a part two. Would you like to see a part two? If so, how do you think the story would naturally develop? Also, who are some channels that you'd like to see us cross over with in the future? I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Thanks again for watching, and I hope that each and every one of you has an absolutely fantastic rest of your day. Oh, and of course, as always, I hope that every single one of you who watched this video got your delicious daily dose of Vanthus Stew.